Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is the psychedelic renaissance. My guest is Amanda Fielding, who is the founder and director of the Beckley Foundation. She has been called the queen of consciousness and also the queen of the psychedelic renaissance, the first lady of LSD, the high priestess of hallucinogens, the spiritual godmother of a large and important field of medicine, the countess of psychedelic science. And she is an actual countess. Clearly, she is a legendary figure in the psychedelic movement. She is co-author of over 50 scientific papers on the physiological effects and therapeutic benefits of psychedelic drugs, even though she dropped out of school at the age of 16 and has no higher educational degrees. The Beckley Foundation has collaborated in research, is currently collaborating in research with eight different universities and institutions around the world. Here is a picture of her from 1970. I wish I had known her then, as I'm also a product of that era, but I'm very happy to know her now. Amanda lives in the United Kingdom, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Amanda. It is a pleasure and an honor to be with you today. Well, that, that's very, very sweet of you, but very overdone, but lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. I was telling our viewers in the introduction, I wish I had known you back in 1970 when that wonderful picture of you was taken because I am also a product of the same era. I took LSD myself in 1969 for, for the first time and have used it many times since then, although it's it's been a long time for me. So, I think we would have been good friends had we known each other back then. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. They were wonderful times. I, I first given LSD in, uh, in 1965. And, but then I learned about how, 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 how it works in 1966, and that made a big difference to me. As, as soon as I took LSD, my first thought was, you know, what's going on here? I want to understand scientifically what is happening. And I realized there, there were very few answers in, in the early years. But one, one of the answers was that the LSD molecule seemed to replace the serotonin molecule in different receptors in the brain? I consider myself extremely blessed, but I met a uh, um, uh, Dutch doctor scientist um, in 1966, after I'd been introduced to LSD for a year. And um, his um, I, I fell in love both with him and his explanation of how it works in the brain. And it's basically saying through the serotonin to a receptor, actually, it, not that that was said in those days, but that it was through creating more blood in the brain capillaries so there was more energy to energize all the different centers of the brain. And it's all so, so obvious. And yet for but if it is 60 years, no one has been interested in listening to the hypothesis. I never talk about it. I, I'm under the impression, actually, that you've helped to sponsor research to confirm that hypothesis. I designed the research. You not only sponsored, but designed. Yeah. I mean, that's why I'm here. I'm not here to whatever, play games. I'm play, here doing what I'm doing because I want to... Um, expand, enhance the knowledge we have of consciousness, because that, I think, is uh, 
thing, which is, I've always felt was the core topic. And I've explored it since I was very young. And, and the amazing thing, now I know you've got uh, your name on some 50 or more scientific papers about LSD and other psychedelics. Uh, as I recall, you, you dropped out of school at the age of 16. Yeah, I left school because I won the school science prize and the nuns, who were very charming, but they refused to give me books on Buddhism, which is what I'd asked for when they asked me, what books do I want for my prize? I said, on Buddhism, mysticism, or whatever. And they said, no, we can't give you those. We'll give you art books. So I said, thanks very much. I'll leave and educate myself. And so actually then I went off, I got 25 pounds, because I think that was all you could take from England in those days. Anyway, it was all my parents had to give me. And I went to find my godfather in Sri Lanka, or Ceylon, as it was then called. And um, had a lot of adventures on the way. Never got there, but um, lived with the Bedou and all sorts of adventures. Yes, I understand you, you lived for some time in the desert with the Bedouins in, in Syria. Yeah, that was a wonderful experience. They, they were very noble. It was like kind of medieval England, you felt, and um, the behavior and the manners. And if I understand correctly, you also made a serious study of Arabic. Well, serious in the sense that I studied it for a few years, but I, I couldn't. I couldn't ever speak it. I love writing it, but when I went to live in Arab-speaking world, I, I I learned classical Arabic. So um, because I was studying mysticism and comparative religions, and Actually, I was learning Arabic because my um, uh, my Catholic aunt was worried that I was losing my Catholicism, and they thought Buddhism was too attractive. So they sidelined me onto studying Islam with this lovely professor at Oxford called Professor Albert Harani, and then he suggested that I learn classical Arabic to read the poets. And I'm not a linguist. And uh, anyway, I, I never really learned much, but I learned to write it, which is lovely. I'm assuming, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you were probably interested in the great Sufi mystics. Yes, I loved them. Yes, they were wonderful. Um, yeah. And that's what I discovered when I got involved in kind of studying mysticism. I think because it was where I live is very isolated, it's on the edge edge of a fen, surrounded by three medieval moats. So you're very much in your own kind of forgotten world. And um, so I suppose partly, I don't know if it was my mother was a Catholic, my father atheist, and my godfather Buddhist. So I had a bit of everything. And um, and from a very early age, I, be, I think children have mystical experiences a lot, you know, if they're birth very in nature. And so I got very kind of interested in that world from a very early age. And uh, I've remained so ever since. And um, yeah, I think it's an incredibly interesting world, uh, consciousness. If I understand correctly, you also studied mysticism with Professor Zayner, one of the world's experts. I don't know quite how I got to him. But for two years, when I was probably 17, I went to him in All Souls, the tutorials with him. He was incredibly shy and, and cuddled his cat. And I was incredibly shy and, um, you know, whatever, pulled at the sofa or wherever I was sitting. And then finally, um, I decided the best way was to take my very handsome um, cousin, um, to, to kind of make a breaking point. And then we got on very well. It's much, much easier. But he's a, a funny, interesting man. He was a Catholic convert. And he really not liked his masculine at all. Or whatever. I think it was masculine. But uh, so I actually, right from the beginning, I, I loved him. He was a brilliant thinker and everything. But I didn't actually agree with his opinion, which is um, his book was, mysticism sacred and profane, 
with the kind of um, idea that drug-induced mysticism is something different to purely endogenously induced, which I, I, I know what he means, but at the same time, I think there's common territory or um, for the, the fertile. I think that I don't think psychedelics give you a mystical disappearance, but they give you the state of consciousness, i.e., the um, cerebral circulation, which is fertile to having that experience, is how I'd express it. One of the characteristics of the great mystics, as I understand it, is uh, as opposed to people who just use hallucinogens for recreational purposes, is is that the mystics devote their lives to pursuing uh, their their studies and and the awakening of people around them. And in a way, that's what you've done. You, I know you've pursued a scientific path, but it's very much within, I think, the classical mystical tradition of a lifelong passion. I, I suppose it is. But I realized in whatever it was, the early 70s, after the kind of doors of prohibition had come down on society, which I think was the most incredible mistake and cause of suffering, um, I realized that uh, science is the new religion, basically. So in order to try to um, change people's attitudes, rather like getting uh, an elephant to eat a pill, you have to wrap it in something that the elephant finds tempting. And in modern culture, science is the, the religion of the times. And so I thought at a very early stage that one would have to wrap it in really good sounds to get through the barricade of the taboo, kind of thing, as it was then. And I think it has helped, actually. I think building it on the scientific evidence base can break through uh, barriers. I I know the research in psychedelics, I think of it really as still in its infancy, but I know hundreds of papers have been published and people say we're experiencing a renaissance of interest in research in psychedelics. Yes. I, I mean, I think there is, because when I started to interest people in the underlying mechanism, which I thought was very valuable knowledge kind of thing. So I thought, gosh, you know, they really want to know this. But um, no one did, actually. Um, I then, yeah, I, I think it's fascinating uh, to try to know more about it. Do you know, I think probably it's more fascinating to experience it. So that I rather regret from going down the route I've gone. I've slightly overdone the kind of trying to um, understand it. And maybe if I spent kind of six hours a day meditating, I'd be much better off at experiencing it. Well, you have made an enormous contribution to the scientific literature. Uh, and, and you started out with this hypothesis that Psychedelics had something to do with the flow of blood in the brain activating more neurons. I'm under the impression that there's some good confirmation of that hypothesis. Thank you for asking. There is actually, as yet, um, not that much, but I'm doing a program of work at the moment that I'm pretty sure is going to produce it, because it might sound kind of rather arrogant of me, but I happen to think it's true. And um, so I've, I've, in a sense, been my own subject of study for six years or something. And um, I just happen to think that this hypothesis that it's more blood in the brain capillaries, i.e. more energy, um, is... Correct, it hangs together. Let's go back then to the picture of you in the 1970s that I showed to our viewers in the introduction, because as you explained to me, that picture was taken on the very day you performed a most unusual experiment on, on yourself, uh, 
treponing, in other words, drilling a hole right in your forehead. Yes. Well, actually, the, it's an expansion window is one is making, and it doesn't matter where it is in the skull or the cr cranial system, but it has to be within the unit. And it's been done, actually, since the beginning of cultural history. I mean, I gather that, you know, the caves of Chauvet in France, which are amazing caves, 35,000 years ago, I think. And anyway, in near there, there's been a f found a trepanned skull of someone who lived or after the hole was made. So it's a very old um, practice. And it's been done throughout the world, very largely kind of associated with spiritual practices. And I think, yeah, probably it was kind of practitioners of um, spiritual practices who probably took um, compounds as well as other things. They found it was a better level to come down to. It's, I think it's, it's a level of childhood. That, that's the hypothesis, because it, the, the hypothesis is that it restores the possibility of the heart having a full beat when it beats systolic beat, and that when the skull closes, it, it becomes a cage, and so there's a slight expansion, but not as full, and that the creation of a hole means that on every heartbeat, the full expression of the systolic pressure is expressed, and that makes um, it more fluid. The, the circulation is better. There's more cerebral spinal fluid floating around, washing out the toxins and more blood to feed the more brain cells. And that's at the child's level, let's say. Say whatever level of brain blood volume you're at from 1 to 6 is a guess, or maybe 1 to 13, who, who knows. But it slowly closes the skull, so slowly the extent of the pulsation is slightly restricted. And that's like, in religions it was called um, the fall of man, you know, the exit of the Garden of Eden in a sense, becoming adult, having a little bit less consciousness. And so that's what, as human beings, we all struggle to get more consciousness one way or another. It struck me that the Trepanning, drilling a hole. I think you used a dentist drill to, to drill a hole, to do it to yourself on camera, making a documentary of the whole process, as, as a matter of fact. But the, I, I thought the, the idea might have something to do with your later hypothesis, or was it earlier hypothesis, of increasing the blood flow in the brain? Yes, it's absolutely that. I mean, I didn't do it. I didn't repair myself as an artwork. Where what they thought I had when I, when I had an exhibition in PS One, New York, many years later, um, the very sweet director, very nervous, apparently she'd been hiding under the table. She was dreading meeting me so much, and then she asked me very sweetly, "Was I intending to repair myself as if I kind of do it on the weekly, um, you know, display show?" Uh, so I said, no, no, absolutely, don't worry, I'm not at all, you do it once. And then the point is to give the membranes around the brain the possibility to expand on the heartbeat. That's all it is, is permitting the heartbeat to fully express itself, like in the fontanelle of a baby. And so how small, I mean, it's something I'm very, very keen to do research on, and I am hoping that I might be in the direction of the beginning of the research at this research I'm actually doing on cerebral circulation at Cordell. So, um, and it's very exciting to be getting near that area in the terms of being able to hopefully resolve the inquiry. So the research at Cornell is more about the uh, blood flow in the brain, I assume, related to psychedelics, not trepanning. They're all related. It's all on the same idea of increasing the blood supply to the brain, as is um, yogic exercises and fasting and all religious practices, meditation. They're all are moving in that direction. 
all got there completely. And so that's, in my view, the common denominator of that is, and it can be got in all the different ways, like adrenal freaks or um, um, running for 120 miles, or you know, there's all sorts of different ways you can get there. Falling in love, um, which is probably the most pleasant. Um, anyway, so there's many ways of getting more blood in your brain endogenously. But I think as tools to um, be able to control that fluctuation of the um, brain, blood, capillary volume. I think the psychedelics and cannabis are wonderful tools. So I am very interested in researching their potential um, just as a fun game, you know, whatever. If one wants to do something vaguely useful in life, and I'd like to do something along that route of helping other people to get high as I think it's a, I, I've benefited from the art. Do you know what I mean? I don't think it's for everyone. I think it's for a minority game. But I think it should society, like a good parent, should let it be possible, make it safe to happen, educate and provide um, a safe background, if you know what I mean. And then, of course, I, I think it can be amazingly effective for healing very large areas of human suffering, like mental illness, um, psychological-based illnesses like depression, addiction, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, existential fear of dying, all those, or hundreds of sufferings, it's really being showed, can be helped. Well, I mean, they've, they've known it since prehistoric times, so they're just slowly refinding an old knowledge, I think. One of the hypotheses, though, that I have interviewed people about is sort of the opposite of the idea of enhancing the blood flow and the metabolism of the neurons. Some people suggest that what psychedelics are doing is actually quieting the brain and thus opening consciousness up or opening the mind up to a larger consciousness as the brain acts as a filter normally to keep us from experiencing what you might call cosmic consciousness. Yes, I, I I totally agree, and I think how um, I think psychedelics um, loosen the grip of the ego, and the ego mechanism I see as having evolved in humanity as a um, as a what do you call it um, a supplement to the loss of blood. Because when we lost blood, because blood is heavier than cerebral spinal fluid, and we stood up, right? Gravity claimed a certain amount of blood from the brain. So, poor animals, we got a lot of advantages. We run, we held, we do all the clever things we can do. But in terms of blood for the brain, we lost out. And so, being a clever little monkey, evolving all the time, um, we evolved the ego mechanism of the animal, which one sees. I had this beloved birdie, and I could see his ego mechanism when he had a sh shock or something or excitement. He'd do his feathers, and the cat licks itself and the whatever. You know, the, we all have our ways of reassuring ourselves that we are we. But the human. Um, compensated for the lack of blood by going further than anyone else in developing this mechanism of internal control, basically on the blood supply, but through having evolved a sound system which could, where sounds began to have meaning and so blah, 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 all the rest of it. The ego was the creation of the human mind, and I think psychedelics um, can loosen the grip of the ego and so the brain becomes more um, holistic and in fact um, our 
uh, research, um, which is fun. This picture, I didn't know. Okay. I didn't know where to put it there. Yeah. That the... shows that. And that's why it's fun to do sounds. That's, I'm, not, I'm, a, I'm an amateur scientist and I use art. But, um, you know, it's fun. It's fun to see it, I think. And I think psychedelics can do that and thereby open the doors of the other type of consciousness by suppressing for a while the constrictions and the limited area which is used in the brain when the ego is in control. If I understand correctly, what you're suggesting is that the, the blood to the default mode network, a lower area in the brain that you associate with the ego is reduced. And at the same time, what the image shows is that there's greater connectivity between the neurons in other areas of the brain, such as the cortex. Absolutely. And that's what we discovered in our research, brain imaging research. The first one, I think, which was done on psilocybin at the Beckley and Pierre Rural Research Program. And what we, I was setting up that research to look at the increases in cerebral blood supply, if I'm being honest. I, because I co-directed, I set it up and co-directed that program with Dave Nutt. And so I was very excited, and I think so was he, at the idea that we were going to see an increase in capillary volume, because that's what I was expecting. And actually, we, we didn't. And, but we did see a decrease in the supply of blood to the default mode network, which is the kind of equivalent of the modern expression of uh, Freud's ego, or part of it. I needed this. Um, and one saw that it had less control, and that was associated with the disillusion of the ego mechanism. And then that left the openness um, to the mystical experience, in a sense. But, um, but it also showed a, a global connectivity, which that kind of image showed. And um, all the parts are more connected, all the parts which aren't normally you know, in control. It's like a government keeps the goodies for themselves on the whole constricts it all into the center, but on a psychedelic, the control is loosened and the blood go there's more blood and it goes everywhere. And that then can, it's actually very neuroplastic, so it can change the setting that people have found themselves in through conditioning at an amazingly deep level. And that's why the set in setting is so important. Um, and it, all of that is obviously very ancient knowledge, you know, that's what spiritual traditions set in place. I think it might be useful to tell our viewers a little bit about the foundation that you created, the Beckley Foundation. You mentioned the Beckley Imperial Research Program. I think that's a, a partnership you have with Imperial College in London. Yes, yes. Well, having left school at 16 without any letters after my name, and having then spent the next 30 years trying through art, because I thought art's the best way. I mean, I was familiar with art, and um, no one took it seriously, so you could say anything in art, and which was a great advantage, without going to prison, whereas um, <laughs> other things were more dangerous. And so after doing that for whatever, 30 years, they were rather like syphilis. Syphilis, or who was it? Sisyphus, yeah. Pushing the rock up the mountain that keeps coming down again. <laughs> kept coming down, up, 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 down, down, down. So whenever I got a, a good program trying to express what I thought was rather valuable knowledge, like um, the terribly nice producer at 60 Minutes did a whole program on um, whatever, I was making an exhibition in PS1 to express about um, this hypothesis. And um, 
and it was very good. He liked it, I liked it, other people liked it. And then it, the lawyer said, oh, she comes over too seriously, we'll have a mass of self trepanation So it was um, boxed. So it never came out. <laughs> mm. So that sort of thing was always happening. So that was a taboo. So then I realized one has to find a way to beat the taboo. The taboo is the enemy. Uh, you know, if you're playing a game of girl, I, I looked on what I was trying to do as a game of girl, and the enemy was the taboo. So how do you can trick the enemy? Into, and then I realized that the best trick was to do the science, and I couldn't do the science as a, a single female without any letters after my name and um, all the rest of the disadvantages I had. And so I decided I'd become a foundation, which in England is very democratic and easy. I forget you have to find a thousand pounds or something. And I, I forget what you have to do, but mm. and I thought um, foundation was a very nice word. It's a foundation, it sounded respectable and solid. And I didn't realize you were meant to have money if you had a foundation, because I had no money. But I founded it. And then I actually called it the foundation to further consciousness. And then after a year or two, I realized, no, that's not the right word, because the whole point of it was to be an artwork which established me as the, within the establishment walls. It made me, um, whatever, not a single female without any money and any letters of name, but it made me a thing. Mm. And so then I was very fortunate to get the top scientists on my advisory board, starting with Albert Hoffman and then Sasha Schuller. But then, more importantly, in a sense, I got um, the top neuroscientist called Ma uh, Ma uh, um, Colin Blakemore. And he became a very close associate of Matt, and when I had been organizing a, a, um, a conference at Windsor Castle, actually, and then I forget what I think, Harry was caught smoking a cigarette, and then the royal family closed down the conference I had been spending a lot of time organizing. And so then um, Colin very sweetly um, offered to, uh, so I could have the conference in Magdalen College, and then we became great friends. And he put his name on as an advisor, and then I'm very grateful. A lot of other top scientists did too. So then I became quite a kind of respectable item, and I started doing brain imaging research along the subjects I wanted to do, and um, having seminars at. I, I decided to have them at the House of Lords. And then, funny enough, can presidents and all these head of um, Russian military, <laughs> you know, whatever, insisted on coming. And the head of the police and the head of the uh, NIDA, you know. Anyway, I got a kind of group of whatever, six, seven days or so people in the House of Lords talking. Chatham House Rules, so I got the top scientists and we talked about, um, well, cannabis and psychedelics and how we should reform the policies surrounding them and the research, etc. And so it, th those were quite influential, actually. And I said to Colin, we should have a um, survey of all the drugs, a calculation of uh, which drugs are the most dangerous and better? Uh, dangers and benefits. We should have both. And he said, well, you're being very naive thinking we could have the benefits because one, if you had benefits, no one would ever um, publish it. And secondly, there's been no research to show the benefits because it's, uh, it's taboo, I mean, it's prohibited, prohibited. So let's leave out the benefits and just have a scale of harms. So that's what we did. That was one of the things. And the idea was to, amazingly, create an ev a, a scientific evidence base to 
based policy on at the global level. So um, it was a funny game to find myself playing. And I didn't enjoy it at all, but I felt it was a necessity then. And at the same time, I set up, started setting up um, collaborations in order to carry out research. And an early one with, was with them. Well, first me and Colin uh, planned one at Oxford, but then he became the top of a, a thing and, and couldn't do it. And then I did it with Dave Nutt. And um, we, uh, we started first, he's at Bristol, we started the Beckley and Pierre. Um, Beckley, uh, anyway, we started a collaboration. But we had to start at Cannabis and work through psilocybin to get to LSD. I mean, it took 25 years to get to LSD, amazingly. But we did some very, very good research on the web, and it was the first um, brain imaging study with psilocybin, and then the first one to look at how psilocybin, as we noticed that the blood supply to the default mode network decreased, and it's in psychological disorders, it's actually um, excessive. It's got a overworking default mode network. It's associated with whatever depression, addiction, whatever can tie one's in. Um, so we thought maybe by lowering uh, the blood supply to that area, one could better um, treat it. And so our research on treatment-resistant depression was very successful. I think it showed 63% people overcoming treatment-resistant depression for a certain length of time. But, you know, in my opinion, you can't expect treatments to be total. One slips back into one's shape. And so I think it's very cruel, the present thing, where it can't be repeated easily. You know, people can, cannot easily go and get... Um, uh, so psychedelic assisted psychotherapy to overcome whatever um, problem they've got. And I hope that will soon pass, actually. And my, my son is now just starting um, to ha have beautifully organized retreats. But sadly, if, if there are retreats, you, might, you can't treat illness. Still, we are waiting for the treatment of illness to become legal. But we're heading in that direction, I think. Well, I guess the good news is that since your original conference at the House of Lords, where it was determined you could only research the dangers of psychedelics, not the benefits, at this point, there's quite a bit of research on the benefits, especially for treating addictions and, and as you say, depression. Yes, absolutely. And, and that's wonderful. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm longing to do, in fact, I tried to set it up a few years ago and then it just slipped through the net in some way. One, using LSD to overcome opioid addiction and, and nicotine addiction. We were doing a double study, just a proof of concept. But I, I think there's so many amazingly exciting ways that we can, um, move forward using psychedelics as assisted therapy or for, at the moment I'm very keen on looking into how it can help neurodegenerative illnesses. And I'm currently one of the researches I'm just setting up, which is very exciting, is microdosing LSD for Alzheimer's. And um, I was um, lucky to encounter a very um, moving um, set of photographs, which was, I don't know if I can show it here, or whether I should, but it's rather nice. Um, wait a moment, this is a wonderful old lady of 87, 97, sorry, who sadly had slipped into um, apathy, positive apathy. And then this is her half an hour later, I was saying how wonderful she felt, and um, can can she can her son who was with her read her some poetry now? 
she said in a very animated voice, how wonderful she felt. That's an hour later. So um, it's fairly amazing that a microdose can bring about that kind of miraculous change. So I'm doing beginning research with Alzheimer's and um, LSD microdosing and um, I'm hoping it will have great and positive results. So what's so exciting about these compounds, I think, is that they can be used at so many different aspects. They're so non-specific. Um, you know, is it, I find, I mean, actually I have to say LSD has always been my favorite because I've just, it's a compound I know best. But um, the fact that with psychedelic assisted therapy, like people quite naturally are terrified of dying and are incredibly unhappy about it happening. They, um, at, particularly at John Hopkins, but at UCL too, and um, Charlie Grove in the old days, did research of giving a psychedelic in a right setting with um, uh, therapy um, to people who were dying and it was just moving the difference that it made to them you know I forget what 80% or whatever said you know they'd, it totally changed their outlook and since you know anyway well meets people I met so many people in my life who, who said that experience I did not changed changed their depression or their addiction or a setting in some uncomfortable, horrible place. And in a way, they used to be called God's, God's flesh. And um, no doubt the hosts were made out of them. Um, and it's very sad how society's got it so wrong, basically. But I mean, it's a kind of reflection of the unfortunate habit of humans to be misled by misplaced words, basically. Bad understanding of the meaning of the word gets us caught up in all sorts of trouble along the way. Well, you yourself, if, if I remember the story, when you first experienced LSD, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think somebody slipped it into some coffee or something like that that you were drinking and you took it unawares and it was a rather traumatic experience for you. Luckily, it wasn't at the beginning. It was, you know, after whatever, I can't remember, six months or a year kind of thing of experience. Um, but it actually was the man who turned Leary on to LSD and he was a thoroughly unattractive man <laughs> and um, yeah and it was a in my opinion a very kind of uh, normally negative thing to do to someone um, and very traumatic I'd say and it taken me well you know I, I think is uh, the thing about trauma is they cut a cut something in the flesh or the bones or, or the head or whatever and and leaves their track and so, um, yeah, it was an unfortunate. And therefore, probably rather like someone who's allergic to water, you wouldn't choose to go and um, fall in love with someone who lived on a raft and used to, um, whatever, or his way across the ocean. But that's what I did. And very soon after this occasion, I, I came back to here where... Um, my old home, Beckley, um, and lived in a hut in, in the woods for a few months, recovered. And then someone came and said, oh, there's a party, come on, you must come, Ravi Shankar's playing, and blah, 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 in London. And so I went, and there I met Bart Hugis, this Dutch scientist, who really introduced me to science and the scientific Understanding, he's amazingly knowledgeable about natural sciences and every sort. His mother, he always said to be a genius, you need your mother to die when you're 18 months, because that had happened to him. And I see what he meant, he meant you don't have the mother to lean on, you have to do it yourself. 
and he was a very independent thinker. And um, he was a kind of brilliant scholar at uh, Amsterdam Medical Study. And anyway, through a sequence of... Um, he, he came from a long line of uh, naturopath doctors. So he came from a rather pure background. Anyway, he was an incredibly um, charismatic character with a brilliantly... Um, sparkling mind, I'd say. And um, so I was totally convinced um, of the joys of uh, expanded consciousness again. And he really taught me how you can use them and manage them. So we used to, in those days, before it was illegal, I might say, you know, we lived on, say, 250 micrograms, which was a normal dose in those days. And we'd have it maybe daily sometimes. And But to, do, to work, the game was working. I mean, obviously there were other games, but the chief game of the thing was thinking, working out why is humanity like we are and how can we improve ourselves. Well, I understand that in in those days, you would uh, take LSD and play Go, the Chinese uh, game. Some people think of it as the Chinese equivalent in some ways of chess, although I believe it's much more complex than chess. And I have to tell you, I was doing the same thing back in 1970. 1970, 71, uh, when I first moved to California, was taking LSD and playing Go. Yes, how wonderful. It's wonderful, isn't it? I mean, it is a pure delight because what it makes you realize playing Go, I, I think, is how it improves your cognition or can. Yes. It can all go haywire, but also it can improve it. And that that's what... I learned from Bart, which I'm very, um, one of the many things I learned from him, was that if it's an increase in um, capillary volume in the brain, which I think it is, um, then brain cells, particularly cognitive cells, use, are very extravagant in their use of glucose and oxygen, late developed, hungry cells. So if you have suddenly billions more brain cells functioning, the sugar level drops. And I had a diabetic father who I absolutely adored, and he, when he came back from the war, he was a very bad diabetic, and I was two or three or something, and I was given the task of being his carer and putting the sugar in his mouth. So I knew sugar level very intimately, because he, he was an artist and he didn't want to lose his sight, and so he kept his sugar level very low. So he was in and out of um, uh, hyperglycemia, basically. And um, so when I got the kind of logic of the brain being pro provided with more blood, using up the glucose and oxygen, so the sugar level drops, and then you lose control. When you're playing Go, if you let your sugar level drop, the men go all over the place, do you know? And you take some glucose and whoop, they will come back into pattern. And I, th I think it's a very clear example of how it can help. And I used to win more go games from against my opponent, who I knew very well. We kept track of all our games. And I won more games than I was on LSD with glucose. And he wasn't. And his handicap went up. So one could see that it wasn't kind of fantasy, one's improvement. I, you know, in those days, Amanda, I was a criminology student at Berkeley, and uh, one of my professors was a, a man named Hardin Jones, who, who was a uh, policy expert in the Nixon administration on the use of, of drugs. And uh, I came up to him after one of his classes because he was lecturing on how drugs and, and hallucinogens diminished cognitive abilities. And I said to him, well, 
Professor Jones, I'm a straight A student <laughs> and I'm using psychedelics and playing Go, as, as you say. And he, he took an interest in me to, to give him credit. He really wanted to learn more about me because I seemed to defy his normal expectations in those days. That's very interesting, yes. yes. My son had a best friend at Oxford who um, was the champion star in top in whatever his skill was in literature. And his mother was advisor of um, Dave, uh, Dave Campbell, or whatever he's called, um, on drug policy. And she was vindictive against people using drugs. So I said to him, you really should tell your mother that you, you know, are a very big LSD user and an absolute full-time cannabis smoker. Um, and then maybe she'll change her mind and realize you can be the top of the young geniuses at Oxford. Um, and do that. And he said, all she would say is that, well, think how well you'd do if you hadn't been on drugs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that it seems to be the response I've also heard from people. And of course, one can never know. Funny enough, my mother, who was a very nice lady, um, but a kind of rather conservative Catholic, um, her family were very shocked at the way she loved me. And they said it was a bad um, example to get Peggy. And she said, well, it seems to suit Amanda, is all I can say. <laughs> you know, it was very sweet, I thought. And well, I, at least speaking for myself, I can say, having used LSD, probably not as much as you may have, but maybe a hundred times, I have no regrets. None whatsoever. I, I feel like the, the work I'm doing today, interviewing you right now, is an outcome of having had those experiences. Yes, I, I think so. And I th I kn I've met a lot of people who've done rather wonderful things in life who said they would have never done it without an experience along those lines. And I don't know. I, I think because... I find if you're at a beautiful place like whatever, bench of monuments in Egypt or something, it just en enhances the sense of beauty. It enhances the sense of listening to beauty. Um, it enhances the sense of whatever, nature, love affairs, whatever. It's an enhancer. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, it's always rather lovely to have a kind of non-toxic, tasteless, invisible enhancer. You know, when I met you uh, in England two months ago, uh, it turned out that uh, when I was at the airport, I discovered the, my favorite football team, the Green Bay Packers, was playing in, in England at, the, at that time. And I know the quarterback of the Green Bay Packers, Aaron Rodgers, uh, uh, who was a two-time uh, football league most valuable player, attributes his talent on the football field to having had experiences taking ayahuasca. Yes, isn't that it? Yes, absolutely. And in Jamaica on the beach, I met the kind of champion um, um, deep, deep diver. And he he actually said he was the champion, his best friend, he can easily beat his best friend. And he goes down with, he smokes a lot of cannabis before he goes down and meditates. Well, people have a hard time speaking about it. It's still a taboo. Yes, yes. It, it is, but funnily enough, maybe the financial world is, le is leading it now. It's rather ironical um, that it, it's such a kind of, there's a certain gold rush towards the psychedelic um, thing. Well, let's hope it, it helps um, fund the research to I understand that microdosing has become very popular amongst computer programmers in Silicon Valley. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think when the taboo um, dissolves, you know, uh, psychedelics will be a very respected part of uh, whatever society for, the, for those who like that sort of thing, you know. But, and that's what I think. It's just 
should be um, one's consciousness is really totally one's own affair so long as you're not killing someone or something and it's, it seems completely mad that anyone ever thought anything else um, so I mean, let's see see if it dissolves in time yeah. but the trouble is when something's gone very excessive one way it usually has to go excessive the other way before balance is gained well, Amanda, before we close, I'd like to let our viewers know a little bit more about the Beckley Foundation. I think it's very important for our viewers to understand that your work is completely funded by donations. Thank you for mentioning it. And funnily enough, the gold rush has made it more difficult to get philanthropy in a funny sort of way. I, I've always struggled with getting my research published, uh, you know, done, undertaken. And um, for some reason, people think I'm very rich, which I'm not. And it's a very, very difficult raising the funding to pay for. And I get research done at incredibly low prices because I know the scientists who are using the thing. Because I, 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 what I'm good at it on the, is on the go board is seeing what we need to do. I know, I know the psychedelics and I see the game we should be playing. And that's, I think, a skill I've got to a certain degree and what I enjoy doing. But then the big block of moving ahead is the funding. But I was just in New York a couple of weeks ago and I met some lovely people and, you know, so I think hopefully I, I, I'm no good at funding, so I hope I can, can get people who are better at funding. And then I hope that together we can do research which will bring these, I think, amazingly potentially beneficial tools uh, to modern man who is woman, who is suffering, mentally ill, all sorts of kind of. Um, pandemics, in a sense, who are suffering at the moment. And I think um, the clever use of psychedelics and or clever use of consciousness, I mean, it doesn't have to be psychedelics, psychedelics are just one of the areas, uh, one of the tools which can uh, give us the control of changing our level, in my opinion. But that's to be proved. And so at the moment I'm doing this program and it goes from, is, is actually, I promised Albert Hoffman, the maker of LSD, that I would re, reintroduce his baby into society where I think it should be kind of respected as in a sense the queen of psychedelics um, because it's so pure and so minimal quantity and so... Um, um, transformational kind of thing. It can be either doing something at a minute level in, in to rectify, I think, neurodegeneration and different sorts of things like that, or it can be used to, in a large quantity to change consciousness in a way that is very neuroplastic, so people can bring about changes with it and I learned about changing how you could change because I was a tobacco smoker very because I was very tall and I wanted to take it, nicotine stop on growing so at 13 I started smoking behind the bushes and by 20 whatever three I was quite addictive and then Bart that character in my life it came up and he said it's a disgusting habit so I said well I'll stop it so I took LSD, decided to stop it, and never smoked another cigarette. And so 40 years later, when I was talking to Roland Griffiths at John Hopkins, and I, I think I had 5,000 pounds to invest in some research. And he very sweetly said, well, what, what, what do you suggest? And I, I said, well, I gave up smoking tobacco. Um, why don't we try that one? And then we did the study of overcoming 
um, nicotine. At least they did it, but I feel blessed in being involved in it. And um, overcoming nicotine, which actually has, I think, something like 80% success rate. And so it is a magic elixir, I think. And I think research can demonstrate it. So I would be very grateful for anyone who um, helps fund the research. And I'm just starting a thing called, what am I calling it? I forget, Beckley Foundation Scientific Research um, Program Fund. But I mean, it's rather like Beckley Foundation. It's just something in my head. But I'd be very grateful if anyone felt like funding, big or small, and helping this research happen. So one of the researches, the number one, is at UCL and which is very leading a university in London, England, and King's, another lovely one, and doing a research using the latest brain imaging technology, the Tesla 7 fMRI, which gets a better resolution than ever got and never been used on psychedelics, and then doing a personalized treatment where we do each individual with that and Meg, big doses, twice, in order to find out what are the mechanisms underlying the mystical experience as far as we can, in order that one can then hopefully try to encourage them happening when people go through therapy, apart from just interesting for human consciousness to know what is the mystical experience. So that's a one very, very exciting one. And then at the other end of that is then in the middle is looking at, at um, how, how actually do these compounds bring about that change in the brain. And in my um, mind, it's still um, increasing the blood supply. This is LSD, this is normal, and this is connectivity, activity. So it just expands the activity. And surely it's, in a way, better to have more of one's brain working than less. Amanda, it has truly been an honor for me to have this conversation with you, and I hope we have more in, in the future. I know you have so much to offer and, and, and so many stories, and I want to let our viewers know that we will uh, post a link to the website of the Beckley Foundation in the description of this video. So from the bottom of my heart, Amanda, thank you so much for being with me today. Well, thank you so very much for asking me. Thank you. Lovely. It's been fun seeing you again. For those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.